in my presentation, I'll be looking at these things, um, what the situation was like before 1770, um, then the arrival of Europeans, what happened then in the late 18th century, Federation, the 20th century, um, post-World War II migration, uh, and the arrival of very large numbers of people with limited English proficiency. So I'll be using that acronym a fair bit um, this afternoon. Problems and solutions, and looking at then the establishment of infrastructure, which occurred in this country. Um, and lastly, integration, diversity, and social cohesion as goals, and translation as the means to achieve these. To look at the situation before 1770, um, Australia then, or whatever the landmass, uh, whatever name you want to give to the landmass then, was, was highly multilingual, which is well known. There were approximately 250 indigenous languages. Uh, what we do know also about that time, because it's also continued beyond uh, the settlement of Europeans, is that within the different linguistic groups that existed, indigenous ones, there was a high degree of exogamy, marrying outside your group which meant that within families there were often mothers and fathers who had different language backgrounds. This led to bi and multilingualism as a common feature of families. So, so you, can, you can read between the lines to know that often children were the protagonists or those pressed into service if there were situations where other relatives were present who did not have proficiency in the language that was being used that they were often lay interpreters, those providing interlingual transfer. So lay interpreting, if you like, occurred between groups, but also within families. Interestingly, with the social relations that existed with indigenous groups, within families there were also prohibitions to contact with people within the extended family. Um, some of you might have heard of the notion of boys and cousins, or men's language where there's actual uh, prohibitions to language transfer. And we'll talk about that in a moment. So what we had in 17, up until 1770 was a large amount of lay translation or lay interpreting. People who were doing, providing interlingual transfer weren't doing so because they were paid. They weren't doing so because they were trained or accredited. It was a fact of life, a rather unremarkable thing, probably in most cases because Linguistic skills and linguistic gaps in, in certain communicative, communicative situations would have led people to providing to the transfer. Those of you familiar with translation studies will be knowledgeable perhaps of the term natural translation. This came from Brian Harris. He was a translation scholar, um, a British Canadian one based in Spain for quite a time. Um, he was a translation scholar and taught translation in Spain for many years. What he also noticed was that outside the university where he taught, he was often engaging in interlingual transfer and witnessing it happening. And he kind of asked the question, is this any different from what I'm actually doing within the lecture field or what I'm teaching in the classroom? This is still interlingual transfer. And so he coined the term natural translation to refer to this everyday activity, bilingualism being a prerequisite, Interlingual transfer being something which can grow from that, it's not axiomatic that people who are bilingual automatically want or engage in interpreting and translation, but it commonly happens. He also applies it to language learning. These self-directed exercises that people do when they're acquiring another language, which involve uh, interlingual transfer, are things which he classifies as natural translation. So there's obviously lots of natural translation happening in this country before 1770 and after. One of the first natural translators, he wasn't paid, he wasn't trained, he wasn't rewarded really, he was in alone. He was a young man who was captured by the recently arrived um, colonial powers and trained in British ways. He was introduced in English language, things were explained to him, and he was a quick learner. His role of being a quick learner and acquiring English quickly meant that he soon became an intermediary, mediator. And so, for example, he explained indigenous things. He lived down, well, I guess in the area close to Sydney Harbour. That's where he was based. Um, um, 
he explained things to the recently white British colonizers uh, about circumstances, about situations, about things, etc. And things also went in the other direction. He also coined, if you like, terms which were now which were foreign to Indigenous Australians that had been introduced by the British. And you can see an account given by a chronicler of the time of, of what Benelon did. If you look down the bottom, um, he was very free in sharing the information that he had about his own Indigenous group with the British colonisers, which is often something that many Indigenous groups are less <coughs> willing to do. Um, he was seen by his own group as, as, a, as a traitor. By the way, when the British arrived in Australia, they didn't have any interpreters. They didn't think that they need any, because, hey, the British, everyone speaks English. Um, this contrasts with Christopher Columbus, when he sailed uh, from Spain towards the Western Hemisphere, hope, thinking that he would hit Asia, he had a Hindi, an Arabic, and an Assyrian interpreter in tow. That perhaps gives you even, um, an idea of the differences between Spaniards and British when it comes to um, colonial voyages. These are some other um, accounts given by um, an Australian-born translator scholar, uh, Judy Wakabayashi, um, and she traced through historical records, etc., uh, what could have been happening at the time. Um, there are so few records of really what happened in terms of interlingual transfer. Um, there are some sporadic records about the entry of Indigenous words into English and vice versa very little about the situations in which this happened. So she kind of reads between the lines to construct some of the things that Benelon would have been doing. Uh, an example uh, that she does give is, for example, here, where gun was literally rendered in the local indigenous languages as a fire, uh, a stick of fire. To return to this notion which I talked about before, which was poison cousins, uh, I talked about in indigenous families, um, exogamy being a common event, a common occurrence, where adults marry outside their group. Um, there are taboos, though, within this extended family arrangement, and uh, these taboos relate to very often a man and his mother-in-law that they are not to have any contact. Some people might think that that too is a really good idea. Um, but jokes aside, um, this type of prohibition of contact uh, is complete, which means that um, a man, a husband and his mother-in-law have no contact, they don't talk to each other. In fact, her name is not uttered by him and vice versa which gives you an idea of very different social relations um, in extended families that perhaps um, exist in other places. Now, I talked about interlingual transfer and natural, trans natural translation being all over the place, and kids would have been doing this, particularly if they, their parents have different linguistic groups. What does a child do, though, if the relationship between themselves and the person with whom they could be linguistically mediating is that of a poison cousin? In remote communities in central and northern Australia, this is a common problem. There are so few speakers of a particular language that an interpreter is likely to be related to the person they're working with. And it's possible that the relationship between the two could be that of a poison cousin. How do they get around it? Um, there was a presentation given last, at the end of last year at the Monash University of the Oz Conference by two um, Indigenous interpreters from the Northern Territory um, Aboriginal Interpreter Service, and they talked about manoeuvring around this prohibition, this social prohibition, to still provide interpreting services. It was a fascinating presentation. They are actually um, trained, and professionally paid interpreters. To return to the colonial period, uh, Ben Along was a natural translator. Legally, what was happening at this time, colonies had been established, New South Wales, Victoria, Van Diemen's Land, Tasmania. And colonies being colonies have uh, the rules of the 
col the colonial power pertained in the colonies. So, for example, the colonies themselves did not have laws. Those laws from Great Britain applied in each of the colonies. Great Britain does not have an official language. Great Britain does not even have a constitution. When the empire doesn't feel threatened linguistically about things, the empire does not have to state what its official language is. It's understood. And that's the situation that applied in the colonies in the late 18th century and the early 19th century. And it's only recently that in the United Kingdom um, there's any mention of languages uh, in any constitutions and only those relating to the regional parliaments in Scotland and Wales. The colonies conducted referenda um, and the constitution was written in July 1900 towards then the federation, the, the amalgamation, if you like, of the colonies to form one single state, the Commonwealth of Australia. At this time, in the Constitution, there was still no mention of an official language, and there still is no official language in this country. There's no mention of language. It's implicit that English is the lingua franca and the, the um, de facto official language, but it's not the euro, it's not the legal sanctions. The, the ideology that we can um, that we can talk about that, that pertained at this time um, would have been, well, it's quite clear, it was monolingualism, i.e. the power holders spoke English and nothing but English and that was the only language to be used both in official use um, and um, by those who had settled in the country. There were there, is, there are reports of other minority languages from Great Britain, such as Cornish um, and also Irish being used by groups of uh, migrants at the time. Um, there are also smaller groups of Germans as well in the 19th century. Um, some of them were so geographically dislocated that they had their own language, linguistic exclaves, or Sprachinsen, as the term is in German. Um, and there was some interpreting and translating happening between those languages, but not a great deal. And officially, it was sort of underground. One of the aspects also about uh, Indigenous Australians, um, which uh, there were also um, the intention where the, um, the dispossession, both in terms of territory as well as family relationships within uh, groups, amongst groups of Indigenous Australians, was intentional in terms of the stolen generation. Target, an intention between behind the style of generation was that linguistic transmission uh, would be halted between generations. And if you take children away from parents, you remove the possibility for them to acquire the language of their parents. Towards the middle of the 20th century, the Australian Prime Minister at the time um, made the statement that this country, Australia, either had to be populated or it would perish. Australia had a shock in the, tw in the Second World War in that the northern part of Australia was bombed and there were submarines found close to Sydney Harbour. This feeling of vulnerability was very sharp, was very pronounced. Um, Australia's population at the time, at the end of World War II, was about four or five million in a huge country. Um, the language changes a little bit. Um, which is used in, in relation to those arriving in this country. Um, there were small, but still increasing numbers of people coming to this country who did not have English as their first language. Uh, and there were lots of derogatory and pejorative terms to, to refer to them as. Um, Arthur Caldwell, the Prime Minister at the time, said that we need to call these people, even if their English is not perfect, newcomers, new Australians, new settlers. Statistically, um, this is probably well known to most of you, the post-World War II period witnessed a very high level of immigration. Um, the biggest group was still English speakers from Great Britain and Ireland, but for the first time large numbers of people arrived in this country who spoke no English, from Italy, from Greece, uh, from Germany, etc. And this was a challenge. This presented both the authorities as well as English-speaking residents with challenges in communicating with 
these growing numbers of people who did not speak English or did not speak very English very well, so the communication was very was often very difficult. By the 1960s, um, three million migrants had arrived. Um, at this stage, at this time, there was very little, if any, formal English instruction available to those who were here and who even wanted to learn English. There was simply no facility for them to do so. This was something experienced on a daily or regular basis by a number of people. As you can imagine, doctors, lawyers, teachers, union officials complained that they were working with people with whom they could not communicate properly. It was an increasing problem. And the increased immigration pointed to a larger and larger body of people who did not have proficiency in English with whom it was very difficult to, very, very difficult to, to communicate, if at all. It wasn't just individuals who <coughs> who talked about this problem privately or publicly. Um, within certain professions, people organized and reported this to their professional associations, the AMA, the Australian Medical Association, the Bar uh, Association, etc. And these associations started to collate this information that was coming from their members. And they started to write to government to say, these things are happening. We have so many people we work with that we cannot communicate with. So we need to do something about this. And one of the suggestions, an obvious one, but it still had to be made, was there, was there is a great need for the provision for interpreting services. These are a couple of um, accounts given by um, people who um, by social workers who had their own uh, anecdotes to share, and I'll give you a moment to read them. <coughs> These two extracts are taken from, um, they've been archived in the National Australian Archives. Um, PhD student of mine, Adolfo Gentile, who is a name probably known to many of you, is, um, is, um, is, has just completed a PhD on the topic of the establishment of translation and interpreting studies, and he's um, found uh, hundreds, literally hundreds of documents that, um, that show these things being reported by professionals and others. So this problem is a social problem and a growing one. I spoke before about the, um, the concern by politicians in Australia about population or perish. The plan was that this country needed people. And those who came would stay forever, of course, and they would become permanent residents, take up citizenship and stay here forever. What was happening at the time was this was not always the case. There was a small but significant number of people who returned, who did not stay here. The, the, the number was big enough for the government to start getting worried. They launched an investigation called, literally, the inquiry into the departure of settlers from Australia. And they asked people who had returned or who were planning to return, why is it you're leaving Australia? This is not supposed to be happening. A common, a very common complaint that they heard from those wanting to return to where they came from was that they could not communicate. That language was a key issue in the fact that they were unable to work to do the things that they needed or wanted to do in this country because there was no uh, instruction in English or no capacity for them to communicate with others. The alarm bells were really starting to sound. In a functioning public service, when you have a problem, you start to investigate it yourself. You don't just wait for the submissions to come from professional associations. And so the then uh, Department of Immigration started to do its own research. We need to look at what is the demand for interpreting and translation services out there. And they did a very comprehensive and thorough survey of those areas which they thought encompassed all areas of public life um, to see 
what their, um, to see what the perceived need was, they sent out 2,515 questionnaires. They got a response rate of 87%. If any of you have done statistical research on data samples, it's a brilliant response rate. <laughs> you know, a good response rate is about 30 or 40. They got 87% of the 2,500 questionnaires. There were a lot of people who, after having received this question, were very, very uh, keen to send their questionnaires and to tell the government what their position was. And surprise, surprise, the um, the responses that they received um, was that there was a problem, it's a very real one. And it wasn't just government sectors who were reporting this. Um, they that outlined the, 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 the linguistic problems and the translation and interpreting services as a, as a way to address this. At the same time, we're talking about the mid-1970s, there was an inquiry which was done into poverty. What does poverty have to do with language or not speaking English? A lot. As it was discovered that um, a direct cause of poverty suffered by Australian residents was inability to communicate, to work, to function, etc. So the Henderson Report at, at many stages talks about the need for language services for translation and interpreting services. And it says this, and I've put these, I've added these in bold, these weren't originally emphasised, but foreign language literature and interpreters will be an essential part. This is a public, um, this is a policy maker. Let's say, sorry, Henderson was a protagonist within the public service. He didn't have to say this. Um, and he didn't have to, he didn't, he, he couldn't expect really what type of reaction it would, it would receive. But he was felt compelled, after having found the responses uh, that he received, to state this, that this is an essential part of Australian society. There's little doubt that interpreting services um, are needed. Sorry, that's, um, that's the slide that I was, it should have been referring to. Thank you, pardon. And things were happening. In 1973, the Telephone Interpreting Service was established. It was the first telephone interpreting service in the world. It might appear to us today as a very obvious thing to do, a large country, the inability to get interpreters to, to where they need to be, use the telephone. For the time now, this is revolutionary. So we also have pragmatism, people looking for quick solutions to what the problem is and applying them. If we need translation and interpreting services, who's going to provide them? How are you going to do it? Who's going to pay for it? Um, where would it be located? Do you have a translation and interpreting department sort of hanging out there, all of its own, you know, its own entity? Do you embed it in some other appropriate department? Where do you put it? And so there were discussions then, should we put it within the public? because it appears that in the translation and interpreting is so much wrapped up with immigration, etc., that that's where it should be placed. Um, or do you put it in social security, because that's kind of welfare, it's hospitals, it's, it's that kind of area, where do you put it? Certainly they said hospitals were a place that needed translation and interpreting services. Um, that call came from the Australian Council of Social Services. So, if you're wanting to do this, do you do it as a measure which is a service provided, and that's what it is, and it's not wrapped, in, it wrapped up in any other kind of um, conceptualization of interlingual transfer, the needs of citizens, etc.? Or is this part of something else? It was part of something else. Um, the, whole, um, the whole period of post World War II immigration. The numbers of people, the growing numbers of people who were not Anglo-Saxon backgrounds, who didn't speak English or spoke English not terribly well, etc., was, was a fact of life in Australian um, cities, at least. 
de-overhaul a lot of things if you're looking at a major demographic um, issue. And this is where um, we can look sideways. When I say sideways, um, I'm referring here to the area of policy studies. Policy studies is housed, housed in is echo, business and economics and, and politics. Australia is a new world country, um, had many similarities with, with North America. North America was, had the same problems, I guess, or issues with a lack of communication with people in America who didn't speak English. America, to this day, still does not have um, a national policy which addresses those who don't speak English, etc. Uh, the melting pot notion is still that which is dominant in North American culture, where you have to, you, you're, it's implicit that you'll assimilate and become part of the American way of life, etc., and that also has linguistic uh, consequences. You'll dispose of your, um, your linguistic heritage as soon as possible. Policy studies, though, gives us models. If we're going to talk about a change happening, how does it happen? And what things have to happen for a policy to be to, to come about? There's a model which I'm referring to units, the multiple streams framework. And as the name suggests, it talks about things happening concurrently for a policy to come out at the end. The model identifies a problem stream and it talks about things such as indicators. What evidence is there that there's something which needs to be addressed? Focusing events, terrible stories, and there were many of them. Feedback, given to given by protagonists such as lawyers and doctors. And load, how big a problem, how recurrent, how widespread is it? In the politics stream, we have things such as party ideology. How tolerant, how accommodating to immigrants should we be? Um, is this a national issue? Um, are we sacrificing nationalism? A national identity by entertaining this, um, the national mood. We're talking here about the 1970s. It was pretty liberal, no flower power. Everyone's taking off their clothes. Everyone's feeling egalitarian. In North America, the ethnic revival was happening at the same time. People who had Polish grandparents no longer felt ashamed of it, and they told everyone that they had Polish grandparents. That kind of stuff was happening. In the world, and so, and also, Australia is becoming a quite affluent country, and so could the country afford these things, such as interpreting and translation studies? Um, and the balance of interests. If we do something about this, is it going to cost us votes? Could it possibly win us votes? Um, in the policy stream. Our value acceptability. If we offer translation interpreting studies, how much is it going to cost? How much is it actually going to save in the long term, in the short term? If we do this, where do we expect savings to occur? Um, do we have the, the human resources? Um, can we park them in an area like the immigration department for this to be administratively housed, etc., and all these other things? So, policy studies gives us models to help identify social things which are happening and what their significance can be. We also need the human factor. Um, the model says you need some entrepreneurs, some brokers to push this along, to sell it to the people, to, to talk about this as being a problem, we need to do something about this and this is how we can do it. And if we do it, there will be nothing but positive outcomes. You need people to really sell something. And there were people that were emerging at the time who were capable of doing that. And then, you need moments, um, which are called the policy window, where all of these things can come together. And then, at the end of it, hopefully you'll have a policy. There's things, there are things I've listed here on the left which um, relate to some of the streams, etc. Policy is looks like kind of, um, well, a mechanical process, perhaps in the way that I presented it in the model. 
um, policy is not just things, it's not just documents, it's not just submissions, it's not just um, um, complaints, etc. It's also a process, it's also a discourse, it's also, is, that, is this something people are talking about regularly? Is it in the papers? Um, are jokes cracked about it? Um, that's a, um, a quote uh, given by Joe Lubyanko, who's based here at Melbourne University. He's a, um, a linguist and also a policy expert. Um, and he gives us this, um, this definition of what definition of what policy is. So if we look at the multiple um, streams framework um, and locate things happening in terms of language services, um, we can we can come up with all of these things um, there. We certainly have the problem stream, uh, the indicators, the large number of migrants, etc., which I talked about before. Um, in the politics stream, um, assimilationism had been the policy for the first half of the 20th century. It was starting to become untenable. Not everyone could become part of the Anglo-Saxon bunch, etc. Their appearance, their ways, etc. It wasn't going to happen. So if you ditch it, what do you replace it with? Uh, the ethnic wave, which I've talked about from North America. Um, people also located a nascent un or non-British Australian nationalism. Um, but this could be something which distinguishes Australia from what had been its mother country, Great Britain. So on the right hand side, I've also listed um, some of the things that I've outlined and a few more in terms of the policy stream, its value acceptability. I mean, some of these things just appear like common sense, but you actually need to bring them together to persuade policy makers and power brokers that this is what's happening, we have problems, but this is how we can address them. The entrepreneurs that I was uh, talking about before, there were two at the time, the very prominent ones. The first one was a, a man called Al Gradsby, who was himself a trilingual, who uh, championed, if you like, the, the um, not only the rights, but the profile of non English speaking Australians, talking about their work ethic, um, their saving capacity. Um, their self-sacrifice, their family-mindedness, and all these other things, and also their culinary uh, giftedness, etc. So he kind of sold non-British uh, non aspects, cultural aspects, to a population that was warming to them, but still wasn't quite sure to a certain extent. He was also a very hard-headed lawyer. His name was Frank Galvely. He collected, he was one of the protagonists in this departmental survey. He he, he crunched all the numbers and he said to people, look, this is all we have as a nation. We have a problem. It's going to cost us this much. This is a very, very um, good investment because it'll have all these outcomes and presented in a very sober um, but also passionate way at times as well. And very fortunately, you had both sides of politics warming to this. It was bipartisan support for a policy for Revision of translation and interpreting studies. Which is interesting because just about everything else in Australian politics is divided between one side or the other. This met with acceptance and support on both sides. So this policy window had, had, was opening. Um, admittedly, it was top down. It did require leadership from the top, from politicians, to deliver this to sellers, etc. Um, but arguably he was catching up with something that was already the social reality. So what happened? Institutionally, for the first time ever, um, interpreting and translating started, started to be taught at universities or then they were called colleges of advanced education. Because you had to establish an infrastructure of translators and interpreters to work in this area that you're creating. Now, I've put down here that the policy of multiculturalism um, language services are perhaps a prominent aspect of multiculturalism because it's perhaps a conspicuous thing. Um, it's certainly, this was not the only hallmark of multiculturalism, but arguably TNI services could not have been 
comprehensively introduced across public services and the non-government sector as easily if there wasn't the social public policy of multiculturalism to, to, to underpin it. So things happened. Things started happening. Multiculturalism was more or less officially adopted as the national policy of this country by about 1975. I talked about the interpreting service being established in 1973, um, courses in Canberra, Melbourne and Sydney, and plans were afoot to establish an authority to certify or accredit these people who would be working as interpreters and translators. You kind of want to have a, um, an assurance of the standard of competence and practice of people who are going to be working as translators. That led then to the big oh, Sorry. That led in 1970 to the establishment of NATI, 40 years ago, um, which has since then certified translators and interpreters in 120 languages. That's a very large group of languages. If you look at the Chartered Institute of Linguists in Great Britain, they certify about 45. If you look at Canada, they certify about 25. The NATI certifies a far larger stretch of uh, a number of languages than any other international comparative um, uh, international body. Initially, in 1977, it was only migrant languages plus traditionally taught foreign languages, such as French and German. In 1982, Auslan was added, as well as indigenous languages. Okay, I've been talking about migration. They're Australian-born most of the time. What's happening here? What we see here is infrastructure having been set up um, to address a particular issue. Where other comparable processes pertain, such as um, access and equity, um, egalitarianism, offering opportunities to everyone regardless of their physical ability. And if you have an institution such as NATI, which is already doing testing of interpreters and translators, then it makes it a lot easier for the testing and um, training of sign language interpreters, Auslan interpreters, to be housed within this piece of infrastructure which has just been um, established. And the same thing happened with indigenous languages, also uh, included in 1982. So the battles fought by others could then also um, work out to be in favour of those other groups who rightfully also needed um, certification for the languages spoken by them. So we see a broader than just the migrant immigration base to it. And arguably as well, it's helped NATI's existence in that it's less easy to get rid of an organization that only services, um, sorry, that services a large group, of, a large variety of groups um, than just, let's say, migrant groups. If, let's say, politics were to change in this country and migrant groups were no longer to be um, serviced with services in the way that they are at the moment, and if you were to get rid of NATI, you would then also affecting these two other groups. So the, um, this is fortuitous in terms of the activities that NATI, for example, engages in, in servicing multiple groups. Are we getting close to a policy? Well, we've got multiculturalism, but that's, that's kind of this universal social and public um, principle. Multiculturalism there, are, there is actually a multicultural act in this, in this state. Multiculturalism, though, was not a law enshrined at Commonwealth level. It became an element of all new social and public policy. <coughs> that if, you're, if you're governing or deciding what types of services you offer to the populace, that this will be a principle by which these services are offered. This country came close to a translation and interpreting um, policy, if you like. In 1987, the national policy on languages was released, again by Joe Lobianco, the Union. Um, 
and it had four areas. Um, acquisition of English for those who had not had access to do so. Teaching of community languages. Kind of understood as being migrant languages and also the traditional foreign languages. Including also Asian languages. Um, an increase in um, the teaching of Aboriginal languages, which was revolutionary at the time, 30 years ago. And sometimes also requiring the codification of them to be used um, in schools for school teaching purposes and language services. And T and I were a big part of language services. So we have a national policy, finally, that talks about this. You know, hooray, this is recognition, this is, this is what we want to see happening. And Joe Lebianco's comments at the time, um, he talks about in interpreting in translation not just that stopgap, that remedial um, activity that you do to help out people who don't have English who have recently arrived until they have enough English to, um, to then function by themselves. The role of translation and interpreting is actually a national attribute, national, national asset. He doesn't say this, but the document has the sentiment of saying, we actually, the nation has something to listen to and learn from those who don't speak English. We need to have a national conversation with those people who don't speak English. Which is a pretty uh, egalitarian and progressive policy. You won't find this in any other Anglophone country. We might all have our um, gripes about the particular services, etc., but the policy is great. The policy is pretty good. These are some further comments from um, Joe Rubianco uh, as well from the, from the NPL, National Policy on Languages. Um, and he says the things that we kind of now take for granted, but at the time, they, it, it, it wasn't taken for granted that this type of um, policy position would be the one advocated at national level. Um, keywords such as access and equity, barrier to access, information and services, these were new terms at the time. I think we've all read these dozens and hundreds of times ourselves. Um, they have become standard um, arguments to defend or to advocate why interpreting and translation services should be provided. It's an aspect of service provision. If you want to offer healthcare services and there's a linguistic barrier, it's incumbent on you to remove that linguistic barrier. How do you remove it? You have interpreted the translators in the story. This is another document um, later, 2016. Um, there's, there, there were lots of, literally dozens and dozens of policy documents that, uh, within health, within law, within education, within um, industrial relations, which talk about if a person does not, is not able to access the service, then this, um, this disability has to be removed. This is from the Australian Charter of Healthcare Rights. I didn't bold that. There's only, um, there are only two words in that whole document that are involved, and those are the two words. You have a right to an accredited interpreter if you need one when using a publicly funded healthcare service such as hospital community health centre. It's pretty clear. So healthcare services now, as a matter of course, have to have interpreting services um, provided. In the legal fields, um, we can see similar um, activities. Um, I won't spend too much too much time on this because we're running out of time. Um, common law principles required that if a person didn't speak English, then they had to be provided with an interpreter. Um, I'll speed through this to say that the principle, not just in the courtroom, but in the uh, situation of a police officer interviewing a person. If that person is not of English, it's they're required to get an interpreter to interview that person. The consequence of that and other regulations that have been introduced that any interaction between a lawyer, a police officer, a judge, 
probation officer, a parole board officer, etc., with the person who doesn't speak English, needs to be accompanied by an interpreter. If we look at across um, different portfolios, different areas of government services, healthcare is a big area, and of the approximately three to four million interpreting assignments that are performed every year in this country, 80 to 90 percent are within the healthcare sector, at least in the welfare, welfare sector. Um, I've also listed documents here outside healthcare. Um, we're moving to areas of um, general social policy, if you like. Um, within this, this state in Victoria, um, there are policy documents called Growing Together to 2010 and beyond. And interpreting and translation services occupy a key place. This is a key attribute. If you want to do this, if you want to achieve social cohesion between different groups, etc., this is one of the tools that you implement to, to achieve that. Um, uh, multiculturalism in Victoria, there is an act called the Multicultural Victoria Act, which enshrines the need for interpreting and translation. Other areas as well can be invoked, and they are. I know hospital managers who have had discussions with senior management about whether to provide interpreting services or not. And you can talk about uh, these pieces of legislation to say, if you don't do this, you're contravening anti-discrimination legislation, racial and religious tolerance acts, etc. So there's, there's laws, ordinances there which can be invoked to persuade people who need persuading. So how, where does it stop? <laughs> um, well, it needn't stop anywhere, and, and often it doesn't. So if you visit your local municipal uh, website, this is the city of Moreland, not far from here, uh, this, is the land, this is the page you land on, the home page. Up the top we have, um, the city of Moreland, sorry, down here, uh, in the bottom right-hand side, a um, list of languages where equivalent information is offered. Victorian Legal Aid up the top um, is a language uh, link um, for consumer affairs. Similarly, uh, in the far right hand corner, this is the, the first page that you land on. This is now a, um, a common, if not standard, attribute of the first page that um, you see if you visit uh, a website of a particular entity. So, if there's no, okay, we did have the NPL in 1987. I have to add as well that um, the NPL was a, a remarkable document, etc. It didn't become a law. Um, it was nearly going to be a law in the late 19, sorry, the early 1980s to make it a legal requirement that if you have an interpreter, there had to be an accredited one. That didn't pass. Um, but the NPL was a document which, which influenced educational and, and social policy for about 10 years. Nothing has replaced it. So if we don't actually have a translation and interpreting policy, but we have all these services, how can we account for these policies, sorry, these services being there in the absence of an obvious policy? I talked about multiculturalism as an overarching thing. Um, but we now to, I'm going to try and relate what we have to conventional understandings of translation policy, which exist in other countries. Language policy is a general thing. We talked about the NPL, it talks about which language should be taught, etc. It's a rather general document, often produced by um, politicians. Another term which comes up when we talk about translation policy is language planning. That refers to two things, corpus planning, which is the codification of the language, but it also refers to status planning. Now, status planning is when you decide in a particular area, country or wherever, that language, a language or languages will have a particular role, that if you walk into um, a government office or post office, etc., you can avail yourself of services in that language or multiple languages because it's sanctioned legally. 
um, Catalonia is a place where this happens, where both Spanish and um, Catalan are equally available to, to, to people to use. Where that's the case, obviously, you have the capacity for, for the need for, for translation and interpreting infrastructure. If you have two languages present officially, then you need people to work between the two languages to provide the services. If we look at what conventional definitions of translation policy have been from Europe, um, one of the first um, scholars to, to conject about what is translation policy uh, mailets, she writes that it's a set of legal rules that regulate translation in the public domain, in education, legal affairs, in political institutions, in administration, and the media. Okay, in, in many European countries and in other countries, this is the case. There's actually a law which says in these public places you have to provide these language services. And only these ones, and perhaps not other ones that might be in demand, but these ones at least. That's not the case in Australia. There's no policy like this. The policy comes through other areas, through healthcare, uh, through education, through law, etc. So, this conventional understanding of translation policy doesn't really relate to what the situation is like in this country. Um, a scholar who recently con uh, concluded his PhD on translation and interpreting studies in Great Britain, um, Gonzalez Munez, um, writes that translation policy is linked to language policy, uh, both being types of cultural policy aimed at goals which include managing the flow of communications among the masses. And that kind of approximates to Australia, but um, again, no languages per se are specified in this country. It's the service which needs to be provided. He continues establishing certain types of relationships between groups and their surroundings, or attributing a particular symbolic value to specific kinds of cultural products. Symbolic value to specific kinds of culture products. That does not apply to Australia. The symbolic or cultural value of a particular language is not valued particularly, nor is it devalued. It's simply an attribute of a person. The language is only important if it's a barrier to service provision. People who come to Australia for the first time often think Australia clearly has a strong. Um, um, affords a strong symbolic value to Chinese, Italian, Arabic, Vietnamese, etc. There's so many signs, there's so, much, so many instances of translation and interpreting. That's not the case. Those languages are simply those spoken by large groups. Um, if they change, so do the languages. The languages per se don't. So, this um, this situation in Australia is perhaps different from other countries, particularly European ones. Maylitz then tried to synthesize, when she looked internationally, what types of situations she found, um, how things happened in some countries as opposed to others. Um, and she found these, well, she distinguishes four different groups. If you look at the third one, that's the one which relates to the Australian situation, was institutional monolingualism and translation to the minority languages. Doctors, lawyers, teachers typically won't speak a lot, they will speak English with the client or the service user, and the intermediary provides the language transfer. So, um, in concluding, Translation policy in its conventional sense is perhaps understood in, in Europe it does not really exist in this country. What we, we have to look elsewhere if we want to find policies that, um, that regulate its, um, its presence. So if we look at ideologically um, what's happened in this country over the last hundred years or so, where we had a policy of the, the white Australia policy, um, the goal was assimilation, and the means uh, through which you achieve that are uh, uh, monolingualism as an implicit characteristic. Um, everyone speaks English, uh, and if 
parents want to teach their language to their children, there were lots of obstacles placed in their path. Multiculturalism arrived, integration rather than assimilation was the goal, and T9 assumed a facilitative function. Multiculturalism is not dead, despite some people's beliefs. What we also see in the public sphere are terms such as diversity, social cohesion, as being uh, aspirational goals in social policy. Um, and what we see is then that TNI still performs a facilitative function, but it also has a symbolic one, i.e. the fact that services are provided in other languages shows what this country is about, what services in this country should be doing, even if they're not consumed by the person who could be consuming them, etc. I'll conclude with an anecdote. Um, I used to work in Broadmeadows, and there's a very large Assyrian community in Broadmeadows. Um, only the very, very oldest members of the community uh, read Assyrian. All of them have become Arabic dominant in terms of literacy, literacy skills. They still form a large demographic group in that area. The municipality, Hume, doing the right thing, includes their language in official documents and interpreting and translation services. On the new library, there is the word library, city of Hume, in Assyrian. Most of the Assyrians can't read it. They can read it in Arabic, but not Assyrian. It, there's no language transfer happening, no meaningful language transfer happening, but this is a symbolic aspect of this, um, which, is, which is indicative of, of what the council is doing, um, in addition to the facility one. I might conclude by describing translation as provision of services less so as, an, as a consequence of translation policy, but as Aldous Oslin once said, more a product of cross-portfolio policy making. That concludes my presentation. Thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you.